everyone. Welcome to this week's chapter recap where we are reading through the book of Job, specifically Job chapter one to Job chapter 28. My name is Corey. I'm with Bible Discovery and Bible Discovery TV, and I'm here with my husband, Matlock. Hi, Matlock. Hey. Hey. Hey, I'm excited to be here for Job. For Job. We're finally in a section that's not just raw history, so I'm excited about it. Yeah, and this is where I get slightly less excited, <laughs> but this yeah. is why we balance each other out. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Not that Job isn't exciting. It's just yeah. it's less tangible. To recap. Yeah. Yes, I understand that. For a recap, it's much more difficult. So yes. I understand that. Yeah. yeah. Sure. <laughs> because it's essentially a long series of argumentation that we have to try to recap, but it'll be good. So that was our assigned reading this week, Job 1 to 28. So let's jump right in. Job chapter one. So in Job chapter one, we meet Job. Um, He's described as a wealthy man, as a God-fearing man, a God-loving man, a family man. He has children. Um, we, We then skip from, we move from this image of a man trying to live for God and trying to run his family um, in a godly way, uh, we move to an unearthly space. So a heavenly meeting between the angels and God or the sons of God and God and the adversary, Satan, is engaged in dialogue by God and God brings up Job as an example. So Satan charges that Job only loves God because Job is so wealthy and so prosperous. So um, a test is essentially set in motion where Job's not allowed to know what's going on, but he's going to lose all of his wealth. So in one day, uh, still in chapter one, Job loses all of his oxen and donkeys to attackers. So that's... um, huge commercial value, economic value, his sheep and his servants to fire, more economic value, his camels to uh, raiders, and then his children die in a natural disaster. So Job gets all of the word of, of all of these different disasters on the same day. Now, in Job's grief, we're told of his reaction that in his grief, he still worships God. And he says this, this famous phrase in verse 21, naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I will depart. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. So he's he is sticking to his guns. He's sticking to his faith in that. Um, and verse 22 says, in all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrong doing, uh, which is really interesting. So um, we see that, you know, Job doesn't believe that it's God's job to ensure that we're wealthy and that everything goes perfectly in our lives. We, we see that right away out of Job's reaction. Okay, Job chapter two, the scene switches back to heaven again, the heavenly, you know, space. And Satan charges that, you know, Job hasn't cursed God yet because he still has his health. You know, you've taken everything from him, but he's still healthy. He's not feeling physical pain. So as a result of this, Job is afflicted with sores all over his body, from his head to his feet. Um, And then we interestingly see Job's wife, Uh, end up speaking for Satan, speaking as like an antagonizer of Job in verses nine and 10. She says this, are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. Job replied, you are talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? In all this, Job did not sin in what he said. So at the end of this chapter, we see Three of Job's friends who are named Eliphaz, Zophar, and Bildad, they um, come to be with Job and to mourn with him over the loss of everything in his life. And they are overwhelmed when they see him. So they sit with him silently in grief for seven days. Job chapter three. Yeah, but- can yeah, I chime oh, in? Oh, yeah, please. Yeah, okay. So there's a lot. I saw this little finger like, oh, yeah. I'm like, what? There's Jump a lot in. you can glean from that. And in- one thing in particular that I want to just focus on there is because there's a lot to actually unpack, believe it or not, but is Satan himself. So we call him the father of lies. Mm-hmm. But 
from our modern conception of lying, he's not he's not lying there from our modern standard. So what do you but mean? But he is lying. He is lying. So I'm going to mm-hmm. explain what I mean. Yeah, please. So by falsely accusing Job, presumptuously assuming mm. that Job will flounder, right? he's lying. He's like, Job will defame you. He will uh, hate you to your uh, – curse you, God, oh, I if see, these yeah. things happen. Yeah. He's basically making a wager with God that Job will do these things. He's speaking presumptuously. Now, obviously, uh, Satan can't lie against God. He can't be like, Job, you know. But he's uh, not tricking God. He's yeah. not tricking God, yeah. right. But he's speaking so presumptuously, assuming he knows Job's character. And right. granted, he's walking to and fro the earth, as it says, mm-hmm. looking for who he can devour. Mm-hmm. The concept is he's judging human nature. And he goes, I know based on human nature, you will, Job will do that. Right. And what we forget is that there's retrospective lies when we lie about something that happened in the past. Oh, I never did that. But then there's prospective lies, lies that happen in the future that you're acting as if you know when you don't know. This is the kind of lie. And in fact, if you watch, if you track Satan's lies throughout the Bible, like 99.9% of the time, all of his lies are prospective. There are things that he will give you, things that are to come. And like, they're like, um, it's, they're essentially wagers or gambling mm-hmm. on things that that ought that it will happen. So it's speaking presumptuously here is part of lying. Mm. The only time Satan speaks retrospectively in a lie is in the Garden of Eden, and he says, "Did God really say?" But right. in that, it's not a direct lie; it's a deception. He's trying to deceive you. He's emotionally pulling you. He didn't say yeah, he's God didn't. Doubt. Right? He's, he's planting doubt. So the point there is that like there's only one instance of a retrospective lie. The rest of it is prospective. So it, this instance gives you insight to that lies are are more than just lying about something that happened. Mm-hmm. They're future tense, mm-hmm. and that's where it comes into believing in false things could be future tense as well. But that's another story. There's something to some some insight to gleam in there from just the opening yeah, chapters. That's interesting. Something to chew on for sure. Yeah. Okay, Job chapter 3. Job curses the day that he was born. He's in such agony. And he poses two rhetorical questions in this chapter. Why was I even born? And why does life remain in those who want to die? Uh, So essentially, why does God still give people who want to die life? Um, Job doesn't curse God in this chapter, but he does want to die. And he's confused about God's purpose purpose for his life. Uh, so why is life given to a man whose way is hidden, whom God has hedged in? So why doesn't God just kill me sort of thing? So we see the dire straits that Job really, really is in. Job chapter four and five, we have Job's friend Eliphaz uh, begins to speak to Job. So Eliphaz responds, first of all, to Job cursing the day of his birth. Um, and remember, Job's just posed those two questions in, in in a lament, in his mourning. Why was I even born? Why is God even keeping me alive in this state? Um, and Eliphaz essentially says to him, you've encouraged people going through suffering before. So now let your piety and let your purity be your confidence and your hope. So he's trying to bring encouragement to Job at first here. Eliphaz says to Job, you know, like the innocent and people who are upright don't get destroyed by God. This sort of thing just doesn't happen. Um, He moves on, you know, if God doesn't spare even angels heavenly beings uh, from judgment. He's definitely not going to spare man from judgment. Um, What what's happening to you, Job, happens to fools, to people who reject God's reality. So just appeal to God, bring your case before God. God must be correcting you and you're not dead yet. So he's going to heal you. So just just come before God. And in verse 27 of chapter five, Eliphaz says this, we've examined this. So we've we've seen this before. We've examined this and it is true. So hear it and apply it to yourself. So there's a little bit of gentle encouragement from Eliphaz, but then there's also gentle correction where he's like, you must have done something wrong because God's correcting you, but he'll bring you healing because you have been a righteous guy. So just Accept this correction and and it'll turn around. Now, Job then replies back in chapters six and seven. And I'm going to deal with these chapters together. So 
Job's reply essentially boils down to the fact that he believes that God has caused this suffering um, and Job wants to die because he, he doesn't want to deny God. He doesn't want to deny the words of God, the ways of God, God himself. Um, so it seems like Job is suffering so much that he's actually afraid that this suffering is going to compel him to sin against God. He tells Eliphaz, you're not helping. Like, this isn't helping me right now. Um, he even asks at one point, why would I lie to you about this? I have nothing left. I have nothing to try to preserve. I don't even have my dignity. Um, why would I lie to you about sinning? If I if I had if I had sinned, I would tell you. I have nothing to hide. I have nothing to lose. I have nothing to gain. So Job maintains his innocence in the and maintains that God nevertheless has caused his suffering. <clears throat> um. In Job chapter 7, verses 20 to 21, it's Job says this to God. If I have sinned, what have I done to you, you who sees everything we do? Why have you made me your target? Have I become a burden to you? Why do you not pardon my offenses and forgive my sins? For I will soon lie down in the dust. You will search for me, but I will be no more. So Job's not claiming that he is sinless, only that he has offered the sacrifices and offered the repentance that is required by God of sinful people. So that's why he says, why do you not pardon my offenses and forgive my sins? I'm, I'm doing what you said to do, God. What's going on? In Job chapter 8, Bildad, the next friend, responds to Job. And he essentially just goes, why, why are you talking like this, Job? God is just. He is justice. So he obviously, you obviously did sin. It's not, there's no question here. God is justice. He can't be unjust. Your children must have died because of their own sin. And if you make yourself right with God, God's going to restore you. He's going to fix this. We know that this is true. It's been passed on to us from our ancestors. Everything, everything in life has a cause. Um, and everyone who forgets God dies. God doesn't reject the righteous man. Job 9 and 10, we see Job replying. And his reply is really interesting here because Job doesn't deny the principle that Bildad and Eliphaz had laid out. Essentially, he doesn't deny that God upholds the innocent and doesn't reject the blameless. Um, but instead, he, he starts to talk about some other things. He starts to ask questions about how humanity can truly interact with God when they're on two completely different playing fields of, of knowledge um, and of understanding. You know, he, he says things like, how can I plead my case before him who I cannot see hmm. or perceive? I can't see God. I can't perceive. So how, I'm up a creek without a paddle. I don't even know what to do here. Um, and verse 14 says this, how then can I dispute with him? meaning God. How can I find words to argue with him? Though I were innocent, I could not answer him. So Job hasn't denied that God upholds the innocent and doesn't reject the blameless. But now he's concluded that God sometimes treats the guilty and the blameless the same for reasons that Job can't quite grasp. Mm -hmm. He can't quite understand. Because um, he goes, you know, I'm innocent and I've been destroyed. And as a mortal, uh, as a mortal man, I have no business standing before God's greatness. So Job begins to lament that there's no mediator to stand between him and God and translate. Um, he says in verses 32 to 35, God is not a mere mortal like me that I might answer him, that we might confront each other in court. If only there were someone to mediate between us, someone to bring us together, someone to remove God's rod from me so that his terror would frighten me no more. Then I would speak up without fear of him. But as it now stands with me, I cannot. Um, and then Job tells his friends what he wants to say to God, which is, just tell me the charges that you have against me. Why have you made me your enemy, God? 
Job chapter 11 sees uh, the third friend, Zophar, respond to Job, and he is not happy. He s- tells Job that th- that Job is mocking God, and Job's responses are only proving how sinful Job is, how far he's fallen into sin. Um, you know, he's so deceived. And so far just says, you know, Job, you need to devote your heart to God and repent and God's going to restore you. I'm going to now look at Job's response that spans chapter 12, 13, and 14 all together. So Job doesn't deny, again, Job doesn't deny this concept of if you devote yourself to God, if you repent, then God will restore you and be with you. Job actually says to Zophar, what you're saying, he says to all of them, what you're all saying is obvious, but the problem is it's just not applicable in my case. God is in control of everything. I'm not inferior to you. They probably used to sit around and have these conversations Mm -hmm. about issues going on in their culture and going on in their day. Um, But he goes, but look, this isn't what you're saying doesn't apply to my situation. Even though you don't believe me, it doesn't apply to my situation. I want to speak to God on this matter because he's the only one who knows at this point. Um, Job then begins to accuse his friends Zophar, Eliphaz, and Bildad. He says, you know, you're smearing me with lies. You are worthless physicians. Uh, Will you speak wickedly on God's behalf? Like, in other words, you're claiming to speak on God's behalf and you know nothing. It's not applicable in my case. Would it turn out well for you if God examined you? Are you less sinful than I am? Like, like what's, what's the, so we see Job's attitude begin to shift at the end of 12, 13, and 14. Um, He says in uh, chapter 13, verses 13 to 16, he says, keep silent and let me speak. Then let come to me what may. Why do I put myself in jeopardy and take my life in my hands? Though he slay me, yet I will hope in him. I will surely defend my ways to his face. Indeed, this will turn out for my deliverance. So he begins to feel this. He begins to move on from, no, there has to be a truth here because God is real. So there has to be a truth. And I want the truth mm. at this point, um, which is interesting. So he, Job ends up asking God to withdraw his hand of judgment and torment in order to allow Job to speak with God which is an interesting, it's very interesting way to put it. Mm-hmm. Okay, Job chapter 15, we're back to Eliphaz for the next cycle of dialogue. It's going to go Eliphaz, yeah. Bildad, Zophar, and then back, right? That's right. And so far it's been, they've been increasing each other in tandem. So it's like it yeah. started off kind of soft. Hey, you should repent, think about it. But maybe you'll be vindicated. You know, you're still yeah. alive, aren't you? Then it went to, well, no, you should repent. And then it was like, wow, you're worse than I thought. You're you're so <laughs> deceived. <laughs> right, right. Just, so you the, won't even admit it. That's right. Anyway, sorry, continue. Yeah. Okay, so Eliphaz, in Job chapter 15, um, he accuses Job of being his own worst enemy, of being um, full of rage and pride. Um, he tells Job, you know, your own mouth is condemning you right now. You essentially are a textbook case of what happens to the wicked man who seems righteous. He seems to prosper and then suddenly falls. That whole proverb, pride comes before a fall. He's like, that's you, Job. You are the textbook case. Ugh. Job chapter 16 and 17, Job replies. And he basically is like, Oh, how original. Like, here we go again with yeah. the repetitive arguments. He he He's like, look, you're miserable comforters. I thought you came here to help me through this. Yeah. And you're not doing a very good job. You should be encouraging me and bringing me relief. But instead, you're condemning me and making this so much worse. So Joe begins to lament this situation of his friends being horrible on top of the suffering that God has already inflicted on him, now he's suffering um, torment that his friends are inflicting. Really interestingly, Job calls on his blood to be a witness for him. Um, the only time we, we really see this happening is in Genesis with Cain and Abel, 
where the blood cries out to God mm-hmm. as a witness against Cain. Yeah. That Cain murdered Abel. Um, so which it's just really interesting. So uh, we also see that Job is starting to believe that he actually does have an advocate between him and God in heaven. We see that in Job chapter 17. Okay, Job 18, Bildad's turn up to bat. Uh, and he, he, st- he starts out not great, just saying to Job, when will you end these speeches? Be sensible so that we can talk. Like, Job, you're just waxing eloquent here. Yeah. Like, just, we just, um, and then, and then he goes on and he goes, you know, is the earth to be abandoned for your sake or must the rocks be moved from their place for you, Job? So in other words, Bildad's going, you know what, Job, you're, you're basically saying that we have to change the way that the world works. We have to change all of reality just for you, Job. Yeah, okay. The reality here is simple. You're a wicked man. Yeah. You are pretending to be righteous, but you are wicked. Job chapter 19. Job is astounded by this. It's, he finds it unbelievable. He, he goes, you know, not only has God come after me, it's not even enough for you that God's come after me. Now you have to come after me too. Um, you know, verse 22, he says, why do you pursue me as God does? Will you never get enough of my flesh? He's like, well, you're hunting me. Yeah. You're hunting me right now. Um, and then it, it ends on an amazing Yeah. Why verse. don't you talk about it? For now, na- for I know that my redeemer lives and at the last he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh, I shall see God whom I shall see for myself and my eyes shall behold and not another. My heart faints within me. If you say how will uh, how we will pursue him, and the root of the matter is found in him, be afraid of the sword, for the wrath brings the, ju- the punishment of the sword, that you may know there is judgment. So, long story short, um, he there's this prophetic utterance of that he will see God in the flesh. This is the bodily mm-hmm. resurrection right here, right? Uh, the one day he will see with his own eyes. Mm-hmm. And that he says, these wraths that come to me on earth, beware, because that means people know that there is a final judgment. Yeah. So he goes, the same eyes that I'll see, right, God with, I'll be vindicated on that day. But that also means that there is a final judgment. Yeah. That's a beautiful line there. Now, I know he's being persecuted, like, right now. But, no, but, but yeah. But I, it's really interesting, um, this concept that. Job, when we first see him in his torment, you know, he's cursing the day that he was born and he he's so overwhelmed with grief. And then, but this constant prodding from his friends and this judgment from his friends is actually pushing him to a place of resolve where he's like, no, you know what? God is my redeemer yeah. and he has to be, he is truth, he is justice. I'm going to see my redeemer. This is all going through. It's actually pushing all of this torment is starting to push Job into a place of resolve in right. his faith. Yeah. Which is wild. Yeah, it's good because what they're, he's getting counter worldviews. Yes. Right now, because these are the worldviews of the time of Job was raised. Interestingly, very similar to some of what people some hold today, but instead of being righteous, it'd be like you, you lack faith or something. Something along those lines. Mm-hmm. But um, in this case, you have these different worldviews explicitly trying to counter Job. And then Job's coming back with counter responses to their states. Like, for example, God is justice. They have two very different positions of what that means, mm-hmm. right? Job's sense of justice is different and fundamentally different than, you know, uh, Bill Dad, Zophar, and Eliphaz's sense of what justice. Their sense of justice is karmaic, where it's like you do right, good things happen. You do wrong, bad things happen. Bad things happen to bad people. Yeah, and, well, and Job's may have been... Exactly like them, yeah. except that now this has happened. That's to him. right. He's thrust into a situation where yes, right. So there's a huge theological battle happening, and um, it's really coming to the forefront here as as you, as you go along. And we'll talk more about it after. But yeah, this is good. Yeah, it's good. Okay, so um, Job chapter twenty, Zophar responds. And he says to Job, you know, you've dishonored me with your rebuke. Like, I'm not hunting you. I'm not standing in the place of God and hunting you. And then and then Zophar does a bold move. He's like, here, let me describe the wicked person to you, Job. And 
you see how it perfectly describes your situation. <laughs> Let me just paint a picture for you and you're going to see how it's your life, right? So Job 21, Job essentially says to Zophar, listen to me. Now, like, I, I imagine, like, have you ever had someone be like, listen to the words that are coming out of my mouth, like read <laughs> yeah. my lips, yeah. right? He, he, he kind of does that, like really listen to what I'm saying here. And this will be how you can console me by actually trying to hear what I'm saying here. The wicked do prosper and live on. He's like, think about it. How many wicked people do you know that seem to be going great in this world? And it's no different today, is it? Yeah, like, no. You think about it. So then Job says, so, so how can you console me with your nonsense? Nothing is left of your answers but falsehood. So he's like, if I can prove that not every wicked man falls like me, then how can you say that every righteous man stands like you? Can't, yeah. You can't say that. So Job kind of gets him here. Job chapter 22 Eliphaz takes another turn. Um, this time, he tries to turn their theory that Job is a wicked man into reality, and he starts to accuse Job of specific sins. Right. He says, no, you demanded pledges from your relatives for no reason. You stripped people of clothing. You did not help the poor or widows, and you persecuted orphans. So if, so he, he thinks of the worst sins yes. against God, and he's like, you have done these things. Yeah. You must have. Yeah. Because otherwise you wouldn't have lost all of your wealth. So you must have gained your wealth through evil, and you wouldn't have lost your children if you didn't persecute other people's children. That's you didn't right. have anyone to protect them. So return to God, remove your wickedness by repentance, and you'll be restored. And what's amazing about this whole thing, too, is if you think about it, is what something we can apply right now is having false beliefs about God, they box you into a line of thought that you like. They're essentially going in cycles. Mm -hmm. They can't escape this. They trap themselves in a box. They can't escape this cycle. But, oh, God does it works this way. God works this yeah, way. Yeah, they're refusing to bend on the, anything. That's right. No matter what, not even taking a second to think that they are not God mm -hmm. in their knowledge of God, right? That mm -hmm. they don't have, like, Cartesian certainty in this in this, in this this sector. So, like, because they've tacked on false beliefs, they're essentially in a loop and they can't get out of it. And that's a really important thing because you tack on false beliefs about God, about theology, about different things – it can do just that. Mm -hmm. And that's something to just to keep Look, in I mind. Think we all have false beliefs naturally about yes. God and none of our theologies are perfect. But that's why it's so important to keep studying and keep studying the word and, and pay attention to things that are going on around us and allow ourselves to be challenged by the day-to-day -day things that we see in nature, the th things that we see in the world, uh, the things that God allows us to go through or directly puts us through. It's so important. Yeah, I think so too. It's so important to be soft and to be receptive to the word of God and to life. Yeah. Okay, so Job responds in Job chapter 23 and 24. And what's really interesting is to me, these chapters begin to mark another shift in Job where he starts to respond less to his friend's direct charges. And he seems to more... Uh, he, he seems to turn his thoughts and his speeches more internally, um, summarizing the real issues as he sees them. You know, we kind of see Job starting to transition to this. So there's a few really interesting things that he does. So Eliphaz had ended chapter 22 by saying, return to God, to Job. And Job begins his response to Eliphaz by saying, if only I knew where to find him. So everyone's just taking for granted that repentance is returning to God. And Job's like, nah, it's not that simple. If only I knew where to find God, because I have repented and he's not accepting it. So like, if only I knew where to find him, if only I could go to his dwelling, I would state my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. I would find out what he would answer me and consider what he would say to me. Like, I want to learn. I mm. want to hear. I want to consider. Eliphaz had said that God would become Job's gold and silver. And Job flips it in verses 10 to 11. He says, when God has tested me, I will come forth as gold. My feet have closely followed his steps. I have kept to his way without turning aside. So we have this, this faith from Job that God is still working with him. Mm -hmm. So there's this new determination in Job 
to stick through and see the end, see what God is going to do. Um, we see um, this belief that Job now is, be- he believes that he's being tested. He's struggling with these concepts of um, injustice, undealt with injustice in the world. You know, why doesn't God deal with murderers and oppression and kidnapping? He's dealing with all of these things. Um, he goes um, over the friend's positions, uh, Eliphaz, Zophar, and Bildad's position that the wicked always pay for their evil. And he challenges them, you know, prove me wrong. You know, I don't think they do pay for their evil here on earth all the time. Prove me wrong, guys. Uh, in Job chapter 24, Bildad keeps it short and sweet. 25. Yes, yeah, sorry, 25. Um, Bildad keeps it short and sweet. And he says, Job, no man can be truly righteous before God. So Bill, that's kind of yes. like, well, let's just think about it this way, Job. No, man, like it's supposed to be genius. It's like, right, but it, it really gives you insight into the hypocrisy of their okay. position. Because then you have God judging these people for their in, as if they're doing right or wrong, yeah. but then no man is, is right or wrong. It seems at it, this point they're just trying to win. That's right. And so the, yeah. it, it totally flips, right? It, it started off, the, they sat with them for a week, right? And then it's like, well, and they start asking, as philosophers do, why? Like, why are you like this? And they start yeah. pushing their own view as if it's right, yes. as opposed to examining further to see what is right. Yes. It's like when when your views are challenged, are you trying to learn or are you just trying to win? Yeah, that's and right. And we see here, Bildad seems like he's just trying to win. Yeah, and it's, yeah, I'll just even read the whole line. How then can man be uh, in the right before God? How can he who is born of he- woman be pure? Behold, even the moon is not bright and the stars are not pure in his eyes. How much less... M- Man who is a maggot and the son of man who is a worm. It's like, okay, sure. Yeah. Sure. Yes, no one is perfect. I get, we get what you're saying, <laughs> Bill Dad, but how does that apply to the situation at, at the moment? You know? Yeah. So this is, yeah, where they start. That's their, that's their final hurrah. So more it or less. Is. So Job chapter 26, um, Job busts out the sarcasm pretty hard. Um, Verses one to four, he says this to his friends. Oh, how you have helped the powerless. How you have saved the arm that is feeble. What advice you have offered to the one without wisdom. What great insight you have displayed. Who has helped you utter these words and whose spirit spoke from your mouth? So like, <laughs> oh, what? no one's righteous before God. Great one, Bill Dabba. Yeah. What wisdom this is. Yeah. Um, and then he he ends that chapter basically by saying, you you don't understand. You can't understand God. Job chapter 27. Um, Job continues here. Um, and, and Job repeats his case once again. God has done this to me. I am innocent. And he adds a third little thing here. May my enemies, in this case, his friends, Mm -hmm. be like the wicked. And then Job goes on to quote back all of the terrible things that his friends have said happen to the wicked. So he's trying to put their own words back on their own head here. And the last chapter we are going to look at today, Job chapter 28. Job continues um, and he, he essentially asks, where can wisdom be found in this chapter? Um, There's a summary of this poem that I want to give you. Basically, he talks about um, the depths and the, the literal depths and lengths that people go to when they're mining for precious metals. Um, and he goes, yet not even precious metal can buy wisdom. It's like we, we will tunnel thousands of feet into a mountain or down into the earth to get these precious metals. And these can't even buy wisdom. God alone knows wisdom and to fear the Lord is wisdom. Mm. And that's how he. It's also where Solomon gets his famous proverb from. Yes. Yeah. Yes, it is. Yeah. Job chapter 28. (laughs) (laughs) All right. There's more to explore in Job, which we will continue on next week. Uh, For now, if you have any comments or questions, please pop them in the comments down below. And Malik and I will read them. We love reading them. And we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Hope you have a good week reading and studying. See you next time. 
Thank you so much for watching. We want to keep producing high quality biblical content, but we can't do it without your support. If you feel called to support us, please click the link in the description under donate. Your support really means a lot to us.